Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to stay on time, but before I get started, I'm going to try to do a quick poll here. So I understand that there are some spec cities in this country, so I want to ask, how do you differentiate your attenuation artifacts from perfusion? Who uses EKG gating? We will do it like by a raise of hand. So can we do it? Okay, who's using prone imaging? All right, good. Anybody using attenuation correction? Quantitation? And deductive reasoning? So it looks like, but not a lot of uh, attenuation correction. So for those who do not do attenuation correction, is it just because it's not available in my department? And no confidence in the methodology? All right, hopefully I'll change you at the end of the lecture. Too much time consuming? Well, it, it could be. And does not add any clinical value? Well, then I'm done with the talk, I guess. <laughs> All right, so I don't need to tell this crowd about the issue of attenuation. When we get our hand on our front head and try to look at this, is this attenuation or this is real? The problem is this issue is really created another nickname for our field. People, I can tell you from when I come from the other side, what my colleague cardiologist called me is like, oh, you're the unclear guy, not the nuclear medicine guy or nuclear cardiology guy, you're the unclear guy. Because you put in your report, I can tell you this is the report for a minister who came to our hospital complaining of chest pain. And then the report says, this could be uh, attenuation artifact, but ischemia cannot be ruled out, and there is this dense defect that kept me an infarct, clinical correlation is recommended. And this is when I was like, okay, we don't want your unclear medicine. And this is really impacting our uh, problem, impacting our field, and causing us some problems, because attenuation is not very predictable, not always easy to recognize, and it could give inconsistent effects on images. Now, we always talk about our great diagnostic accuracy, and we always quote high numbers, like in the published literature. But I can tell you that in the public data in the published literature does not always equate to data in the field. So here are three studies, relatively old studies, that looked at specificity, for example, stress echo versus nuclear in women. And you can see, although we have excellent sensitivity, it looks like our specificity is not too high, especially because of artifacts. And there have been some recent CT literature and some biased samples where it shows that the nuclear specificity might be as low as 40% in a recent Jack paper from ACIC registry. And there are some people who are taking this against our field and trying to sell other imaging modalities, whether without radiation or with radiation, <clears throat> to compete for this uh, kind of test, which is probably the most ordered test so far in terms of uh, to rule out coronary disease. And one thing that we, the main benefit for uh, attenuation correction is the impact on specificity. Now you can see here there are multiple studies that looked at this using different vendors, and all of them the uh, pinkish one is without attenuation correction and the blue one with attenuation correction. And you can clearly see there is uniform increase in specificity. No matter where you are, your specificity is going to go up with attenuation correction. And this was <clears throat> most pronounced in patients with BMI more than 30. Now keep this in mind when you read the newspaper and know that the Gulf countries, five of the six Gulf countries, are among the top 10 obese countries in the world. So this is something to keep in mind. And we, I can tell you in our lab, we don't see a lot of BMI less than 30. So our median BMI in our pet lab is actually 33%, sorry, 33 uh, kilogram per meter square. So this is an issue, a real issue in our practice in here. Um, slides are not moving, okay. So you can see here that using in obese patients, the normalcy is going to increase all the way up to almost 90% in there. 
So here's the case that you look at it and you can see here that there is an inferior defect on the non-AC. Is it reversible, tiny reversible? Shall I call it, not call it? And you can see here that in some slices it looks a little bit reversible. In some slices, I don't know if it's projecting that much, but on my screen here it looks a tiny bit reversible in there. But when you do attenuation correction, I don't think you're going to doubt it anymore. You can clearly, confidently say that this is an artifact in there. Now, some people can say I can pro do prone imaging. Prone imaging is an excellent tool. The problem is uh, it induces an interior defect in some patients. It should it necessitates a, uh, additional acquisition. And if you decide to do it on everybody, or you're going to do it when someone checks the images, the logistics of the labs might vary. You might not have always a physician in your vicinity while you're imaging to check your images. So there are some practical issues to do it unless you decide to do it in all patients. And with the increased obesity, not a lot of patients are going to be able to lie prone, and they will not like it. And in fact, some patients actually hate it, and it clearly tells us that. EKG spect imaging, it's a good tool, it's a great tool. I'm not gonna I'm gonna move a little bit quickly here, but you can see here that attenuation correction adds over gating. So you can see here here in red is the static images, normalcy is 54%. But then when we move up with gated, we go up to 62%. When we add attenuation correction the normalcy goes up to 77 and 85 percent depend what you look at so it does increase our specificity and increases faith in our field i thought this is one of the nice studies there are a lot of studies that were done this is one of those nice studies where they brought 494 spec studies from three centers and they mixed them they didn't tell each physician this is ac this is not ac so you are either reading an entire ac study and the entire non-ac study for the entire patient and then you can see here that with the ac sensitivity did not change much but specificity increased and normalcy is getting closer to 100 percent which is what we want to do this is seen in males and females and i'll show you here some cases from our lab where we use attenuation correction you can see here that there is a defect on the lateral wall but again looking at it is it reversible tiny reversible is this just the lateral fat pad once you put attenuation correction this all goes away and uh, it's clearly helpful this is a little bit of a tricky patient because the patient has left bundle so i'm not expecting the defect to go away completely but you clearly see this defect which looks worse on stress so this is sorry worse on rest images on the lower uh, panel but when we apply attenuation correction you can clearly see now that it is not uh, it's clearly a left bundle and didn't go away completely but there is no reversibility in there this is a lady and you can clearly appreciate the interior defect and this one here is completely normal and the last one is a man with an inferior defect and you can see here that it is getting much better clearly and these are just routine clinical cases that when i was reading and I knew that i'm giving this talk i'm just started to select some cases when they come through my lab showing this so there are some discussions now about whether it's source-based versus CT-based. I think this is a discussion, an old discussion now. A lot of nobody right now are using CT-based. Um, sorry, nobody is using source-based, although it does have some benefit because it is the one that allows simultaneous acquisition and emission data, acquisition of transmission and emission data. It's relatively easy, but there are some disadvantages with that, and uh, one of it is that it's not validated for the new cameras, and it can lengthen imaging time significantly. CT, it does give us constant high quality of transmission scan, and it, you can do a calcium score in addition with that on almost all the CTs attached. And this is my personal bias because I do believe at this point we gain a lot from doing a calcium score in addition to the SPECT or PET scan that we are doing. And you can use CT for other purposes, depends on the type of scan you use. Um, however, there are some issues and we will discuss these a little bit further, but there are some artifacts that you need to be aware of. Uh, I think stress, uh, attenuation correction does allow you to do more stress-only imaging. So with the attenuation correction, you potentially end up doing 
uh, sorry, giving the patient overall less radiation. This is actually a lady that came in with uh, chest pain. You can see here an anterior wall defect on the attenuation correction on the upper, sorry, on the non-AC images on the upper one. Once you do attenuation correction, these are stress and stress images. So once you do attenuation correction, there is no need for another acquisition. However, if you've done only non-attenuation correction, you are obliged to do arrest images. So by doing that low-dose CT for attenuation correction, you save the patient from the 8 millicuries or 10 millicuries that she need for the arrest images. Similarly, you have a man here with an inferior wall defect and very similar case where you can see that you're going to stop especially among acute patients, if you see that defect, but once you do apply attenuation correction, that's all taken care of. And you, I'm sure you're aware of the data where stress only now is being promoted because it has similar outcome compared to uh, stress and rest images among patients with normal scans. <clears throat> And this is data from Dr. Kaufman's lab where he shows that you can do even improved outcome prediction by uh, attenuation correction spec. They looked at 876 patients. And I want to draw your attention to this group here, the 1 to 3 SSS, because it looks like in this group, if you, the in the filter back projection, the event rate was 0.7, but it looks like the, a lot of these were not truly ischemic. So the event rate here is not going to be too high. But once you do attenuation correction and take attenuation, uh, attenuation out of the factor, out of the loop here, then you end up with truly ischemic patient and their event rate is going to be much higher in this patient population. Um, my bias is that if you have a dual system, a spec CT system, I do think that you should do calcium score. I'll show you here that we are doing it for almost all our uh, cases with, with the uh, PET scan here. Uh, you can see you will detect a lot of patients who will be higher risk if you do calcium score with that. You can see in our normal PET population, nearly 50% have normal have zero calcium score. But if you look at the other end here, we have about 20% of our patients with the calcium score more than 100. And the outcome of these patients obviously is much different. This is similar data from Mid-America Heart Institute where they show on their spec that among the normal specs, there is about, again, 20% with, with high calcium, more than 100. And on their PET, it was even much higher on this patient population. The interesting part that if you use the nuclear medicine data only, and this is data from the Mid-America Heart Institute, you're going to enforce, for example, change statin therapy only 4.9%. Once you add the uh, calcium score data, now you're going to order more statins. And so it does impact on the patient uh, management and patient therapy in here. And um, this is a case that I never forget. And uh, this is actually um, from my work when I was in the U.S. This is a patient who came to me and he said, I've been having this pain for a year. And everywhere I go, they give me some sort of test and nobody has looked into me. So I pulled up the last test that was done, and it looks to me that the guy had had a nuclear scan, and the nuclear looks fairly low risk, other than that this guy has like maybe an inferior wall attenuation, but he's a little bit obese guy. So I said, yeah, I cannot explain it based on this nuclear. He's diabetic for 20 years, and he did not want a calf. So he was offered calf before, and he does not want a calf simply because his mother had a calf before, and she had a complication, and she died from like further complications. Like I'm not gonna let you guys kill me like you killed my mother. These were his literally his words. So okay, I have a cardiac CT. Let me send you there. This is his cardiac CT. You can see the amount of calcification this guy had, and his calcium score came up to 1741. So based on my data, I've seen similar patients, by the way, in Riyadh, but this was like one of those drastic cases. And you can see in here, this patient, we sent him eventually for CAT. He agreed, and he had three-vessel disease and got cabbage. The guy, ejection fraction at that time was starting to drop to about even 45% after one year of constant chest pain. 
So the point here is like when you look at this, you can see if you look just at the nuclear, you will say this is a low risk scan. I mean, this patient is going to live long. Once you do your calcium score, now you're going to look at, oh, this is a very high risk patient. Now talking to the patient, he sounded high risk, but the nuclear did not really correlate with the clinical status of this patient. So by combining calcium score, and this is my personal bias, I think we can improve the diagnostic content. We look at reclassify patients as having CAD, sometimes change the physician's behavior, and impact the cardiovascular risk profile for this patient. Now, if you have a CT attenuation correction, can you use that CT attenuation correction to get a calcium score? There is conflicting data in the literature. Uh, we did a study looking at this in 150, uh, nearly 150 patients. And if, the, if you don't see calcium on the uh, calcium score, then there is clearly no calcium, obviously. You're not going to see it on the attenuation correction. The problem is that we found a lot of patients out of the 94 patients that we said have no calcification on the attenuation correction, only 55 had on the calcium score. These were obtained like literally one second apart. So one of them is CT attenuation correction, then we did the calcium score. So it looks like it's not going to be enough to, if you want to get a calcium score, you're not going to be able to do it just from the attenuation correction. And you're going to require a dedicated calcium score, which is about 0.7 millisiever. Because but I think that it is you have five minutes. worth it to get for these patients. Now, if I'm in the last five minutes, I'm going to tell you what are the disadvantages of getting a spec CT. And there are some issues with that. There is obviously the cost the source, if you're doing it with the source, and the, the issue of the extended time acquisition. You need to do good QC to avoid misregistration, like in this case here, where you can clearly see there is a misregistration artifact, which is the typical one, because the anterior and interlateral wall are overlaying the lung instead of being in the right place. And sometimes the issue with the attenuation correction is that you sometimes induce a defect. So with the, sometimes there is a new defect that you see in the attenuation correction images, and we don't know what to do with this. At least my personal bias is that if I don't see a defect on the, uh, if a new defect appears, this looks to me like some sort of misregistration. I know different people have different thoughts about it, but I, in the attenuation correction images, that's why I look at both the attenuation correction and the non-attenuation correction images and not stick to one of them because if you induce a defect, I tend to ignore it. I don't think we have a lot of data about uh, this in the literature. There is also the issue of the incidental findings on the CT and depends if you're a radiologist or certified radiologist. When I was in the US, we did the study which was presented last year in the World Congress in Dubai and um, we, we were lucky because we were like integrated team, so we had a board certified chest radiologist review every single attenuation correction CT we did. So we looked over a two year period where we had 1139 uh, patients who had CT attenuation correction for cardiac uh, spect. And what we found there were 11% or sorry, 12% uh, of the patients had incidental findings and nearly 8% of them were new. Now, most of them were not significant, did not impact patients, but out of nearly 1,100 patients, there were, uh, some of them were scary diagnoses, like in some of these patients, like squamous cell carcinoma. There is here an, another patient with an adenocarcinoma there, sarcoidosis with hyalur adenopathy, as you see in here, and the total of 11 patients had new cancer diagnoses. So these were a little bit scary. So if you're going to do it, my bias is that you need to look at these, either get trained or some of these are really difficult to miss. You're going to miss the small lung nodules. We always discuss about these. What shall we do with them? And we face it all the time with the cardiac uh, CT program that we do. But I think this is an important issue that you need to look at these CT attenuation corrections. Uh, some people might argue that you're adding uh, radiation exposure. These are the settings for our radiation. Uh, CT attenuation correction. I can assure you with the uh, adaptive MA, we got a DLP less than 30, mostly in the 15 range. So we're talking about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millisiever. I like it to be noisy and diagnostic, so I don't need to worry much about the incidentals, but at the same time, it's enough and not necessarily to uh, call the patient. So to uh, <clears throat> 
enough to uh, do the job that's needed from there. So it looks like that in conclusion, attenuation correction does increase interpretive confidence and diagnostic specificity in daily practice. There is improved diagnostic accuracy in the overweight, which we have no shortage of here. Occasionally improved sensitivity, but this is not the main benefit of that. And it does facilitate the effectiveness of stress-only images for imaging for selected patients. Uh, if you talk to industry now, they tell you that the market for SPECT alone is going down like this, and the vendors are saying more and more SPECT CTs are being ordered, and especially that the U.S. market is a little bit down. So I think if anybody is going to replace their SPECT, they should go for a SPECT CT at this point. With that, I'm going to stop. Thank you very much.